Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining me today. I have a very special guest with me in the studio. Well, he's in uh, his studio and I'm in mine. Uh, it is, of course, Simon Dixon. Now, Simon is a legendary Bitcoin OG. He's a CEO, entrepreneur, and writer, among many other things, um, and has been talking and writing about Bitcoin for longer than almost anyone out there. Um, Simon, it's great to have you. Thank you for joining me. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thanks, Kai. Now, Simon, about it was about a month ago that you came to the Coin Bureau live event in uh, in London and gave a kind of impromptu presentation, which was which was uh, wonderful. It was such a, it was it was a real sort of jolt of positivity on um, on what was a pretty kind of down day in a way because we just had that news about uh, the SEC suing both Binance and Coinbase and. Uh, you sort of had you gave this amazing presentation where you know a really sort of long view of Bitcoin, obviously bringing some of your some of your huge experience into play as well. So I thought I thought it would be great if we could sort of um, talk a little bit about you and your background, and then maybe go over some of the some of the main points of that presentation um, for those who missed it, and then perhaps talk about some of the things, some of the more current things, including of course uh, that business with the SEC. Um, but also some of the other things happening in in the world of Bitcoin at the moment. Uh, sure, sounds great. Um, so I, I guess starting with uh, my background for those not familiar with myself. Um, uh, so I guess my journey into Bitcoin started long before Bitcoin. So um, my father actually lost all of his money in the 2000 dot com boom and bust, um, and uh, he it was his entire life retirement. He went from completely broke, you know, rags to riches story, self made millionaire, and then blew it all up in the stock market. Um, and uh, he asked me one question. He was like, "Simon, where the hell did my money go?" Um, and that really kicked off an over two decade obsession with the subject of money. Um, worked in banking, mastered in economics, um, and uh, decided in two thousand and six that uh, I wanted to leave. Um, after working on the trading desk and corporate finance and various other things, uh, to focus on monetary reform because answering that question drove me down a massive rabbit hole on how money is created. Um, and before Bitcoin was created, before Bitcoin launched, um, it was very, very it was a, a very strange conspiratorial theorial topic um, that no one really wanted to engage in. So I, I spoke at about 200 different colleges and universities on the subject of how money is created. And it went from people not believing me um, to thinking that I was just a tinfoil hat person explaining yep. that banks create money. Right. Um, yeah. And so it wasn't until um, you know Bitcoin was created. Um, and what we actually tried to do is uh, I tried to create what's known as a non-fractional reserve bank. Um, so I wanted to uh, essentially solve um, three problems. So I wrote a book on the subject, which was that bank to the future, protect your future before governments go bust. And that took me down the rabbit hole of Bitcoin. So it was actually the first published book in the world to include Bitcoin. Um, and the reason it took me down that rabbit hole is um, I wanted to create a bank where you could own your own money, uh, you could spend your own money, and everything was held in custody. Um, and if we were to spend it as a bank, you actually had to uh, invest it in a security and allocate what you wanted it spent on. Um, and finally, we didn't want to create digital currency every time we issued a loan. We didn't want to engage in fractional reserve banking, which is how normal banks work. Um, and okay. it turned out that Bitcoin allowed you to own your own money, spend your own money, and it had a money supply. And it didn't, if you, you know, the, the money supply creation process was Bitcoin mining. Um, and so uh, that was really uh, me trying to create a bank. I actually tried to, we tried to do it in the UK um, and we had to lobby the Bank of England. We spent about, uh, they told us we need 60 million deposited at the Bank of England to get started. And they said we had right. to build it on top of the infrastructure of another bank like Barclays. Um, and so by building it on top, they got to leverage money. And every time we issued a loan, they would create the digital pound. Um, every time they issued a loan. So this was, you know, covered in the book. And um, we gave up after three years of trying to change laws and banking in the UK um, and uh, basically spent all my money and went dead broke. We, we got through all of our wages. I was about £250,000 in debt at this stage, reached the very, right. very bottom. Um, and uh, we found this, uh, I got invited by this uh, hacker um, an activist called Amir Taki to speak at the first Bitcoin yeah. conference. So my wife, Bliss, 
um, got us the last bit of credit card debt. We flew over to Prague um, and I fell in love with uh, the Bitcoin community. It was only about 50 to 100 people. Uh, we started investing in some of the companies. Uh, then we pivoted the bank, with Bank to the Future, which isn't a bank. Uh, we pivoted it to a securities business. And then we created a way for companies that couldn't get funding to get funding. And some of those were Kraken, Bitstamp, Bitfinex, um, you know, money of the Coinbase, um, Ripple Labs, many of the largest companies in crypto, mm -hmm. really. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, been involved in the industry since and, and investing ever since. So Simon, I mean, not only have you, you've sort of, I mean, it's, it's amazing how you kind of maxed yourself out on your, on your journey to, to, you know, discovering Bitcoin. And, and now, of course, you're, as you say, you're invested in some of the, in some of the biggest companies in the industry. So, I mean, in many ways, you've kind of, you, you've contributed sort of as much as anyone to building not only, I guess, the Bitcoin industry, but the, the whole crypto industry itself. I mean, you, you, as you say, you're, you're invested in some of the, in some of the biggest names in the space. Well, um, yeah, it was one, one of the things we did early is because we pivoted from banking to focus on securities. Um, we actually had to change lots of securities laws about three years. It took about three years in the UK because um, I wanted to invest. I mean, I did well because my first Bitcoin investment was at that conference. It was $3. Um, Bitcoin had crashed to $30 to $3 during that event. Um, wow. And uh, that's, where I, that's where I made my first purchase. And uh, I've been implementing some of the investing rules that we'll cover at the end ever since, which changed my financial yeah. uh, life forever. Um, but one of the things we did, and it really brings it full circle because of the, the situation we're in today, um, was we pivoted the business and we became the, we, the, the first regulated crypto securities business. Um, so we secured, we changed securities laws in the UK. We actually had to move jurisdictions about three times to achieve it. Um, but once we had our securities license, we were able to pull together the whole Bitcoin community to invest in these companies that no VC would invest in. Um, so like our first one was BitPay um, and then, you know, Kraken just couldn't secure funding in the early days. It was just too quirky and weird. Um, but uh, we, as the Bitcoin community, we enable people to invest their Bitcoins um, or invest via currency. Um, and because it was shares in the company, we sold it as a security. Um, and then we were able to get through all the securities laws that way because it was a traditional equity investment. So you know, we pulled together, we were pulling together and I was the, the first investor on the platform uh, simply because rather than creating a bank, um, Bitcoin did well and uh, wanted to invest across the whole industry and, and support the industry in growing. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, and, 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 and finding those kind of workarounds to, to make it possible. And I mean, that's, I guess that's something the crypto industry itself is kind of still having to do today. You know, regulations are, are being slow to catch up and obviously that's, that's something we'll talk about a little later on. Um, but Simon, I wanted to touch on uh, I wanted to touch on something. Now, this is this is kind of a, a, a big topic, but it was it was one of the most fascinating aspects of that um, of that talk that you gave last month, and that's the uh, and that's this idea of the six uh, cycles um, that we're that, you know that we're currently in. And what was what was so fascinating about that was not only, you know, it gave it, it sort of gave a breakdown of, you know, Bitcoin's Bitcoin's history from, you know, from the perspective of someone who's who's actually lived it. Um, but it also show, it also gave you know a, a lot of reason for hope as well, especially in the current climate. So are you is it OK for you to sort of just give a, a kind of a, a brief summary of that of those six cycles? Yeah, and I actually, um, kindly, your, your team gave me the, the recording of the video, so I uploaded it to my channel on Simon Dixon, so people can see the full thing where I actually covered all the stories. But um, the, really? the cycles um, really help people to appreciate that um, everything we're experiencing right now is a different flavor of what I've experienced quite a few times. Um, and so in each cycle, there's kind of a theme. And so the concept of the four-year cycle is very well known around halving, um, but also some of the events that tend to happen. And there are always similar events um, that happen every time, but in a completely different flavor. Um, and so once you understand that, you know, once you've experienced, you know, I had $30 Bitcoin crashing to $3 in a week, um, even in a day, I think it was. I've had, um, you know, $1,250 Bitcoin crash to $250. 
Um, I've had my $20,000 Bitcoin crash to $3,000. Um, I've had my $69,000 Bitcoin, you know, crash to, I think it was $3,900 in the, in the COVID phase or $4,000, whatever it is. Um, so yeah. you, you always have these cycles and they're characterized by new adoption every single time. Um, and so every cycle brings a completely new reason why Bitcoin is never going to succeed and fail. Um, and so the first one really was um, the concept of decentralization. Um, so, you know, when, when I first went to that Bitcoin conference, there was a bunch of hackers in a, in a hackathon after the event. Um, and you had to like knock on a door and get a secret code around Prague. Um, and I, I, there was this hacked together vending machine where I could buy a Bitcoin, uh, a Mars bar for one Bitcoin, um, which I actually did in this uh, hacked together vending machine. Um, and a bunch of hackers, you know, uh, just really there. And it was it was a mission of us versus the banks. And we really should never have succeeded. Um, it was just an impossible mission. Um, but there was a, a group of people that were committed to it. Satoshi left that gift. Uh, but originally, you know, he mined about a million Bitcoins. Um, and, uh, you know, he sent some to Hal Finney. Um, and uh, then he was, there was no price. There was no concept of speculation. Um, he was persuading people and then... You know, uh, we had our first exchange and then someone bought 10,000, uh, you know, two pizzas with 10,000 Bitcoin. Um, and it just became slowly, slowly more decentralized. And that was really the theme. It was just trying to prove, could you create something decentralized? It went through the whole cycle of, you know, CPUs where everyone was doing it on the laptop and then GPUs, then ASICs. And that was cycle one. Um, no one believed that it could be done in a decentralized way without getting shut down. Uh, but it did. Um, <clears throat> And so, you know, we kind of moved into uh, the, second, the second cycle. I got my presentation um, on the side. And each cycle mm. really had, it, um, believe it, it was a massive law enforcement cycle, just like we're experiencing today. So in the second cycle, we had um, uh, the securities and SEC doing their first action against Eric Voorhees uh, for launching a Bitcoin-based security where he funded Satoshi Dice. Um, we had FinCEN come out and say everyone needs to register as a money service provider. Um, we had a Ponzi scheme where um, it was ruled that Bitcoin was money in, in court uh, because they were trying to say it's not a, it's not a crime because it's not money. Um, we had right. Mt. Gox collapse with about 70% of every, all the tradable Bitcoin that was just wiped out. Uh, the Japanese regulators went and created you know, regulations because... Mt. Gox was in Japan, and we just never imagined that we would have survived. Um, I remember the U.S. government came out and said, um, you know, started saying Bitcoin is this drug for, is a currency for drugs on Silk Road, yeah. um, and and we never imagined we'd get through it, but we did. And cycle two, we got through that. We went through the halving cycle. Bitcoin reaches new all-time highs, um, and then we reached the third cycle. Um, in the third cycle, and there's lots of events I covered in the video in between. Um, but the third cycle was really about, is the money supply of Bitcoin enforceable? Um, because we were in the midst of a massive scaling debate. Um, you know, all of the, the VCs, the companies, everyone that was important, we were all in a conference. Um, Bruce Fenton does his conferences, Satoshi Roundtable. Um, and, uh, you know, Brian Armstrong was going nuts at the developers. Um, we did a conference in Hong Kong where all of the miners came over and the miners just weren't understanding the developer's perspective. There was language barriers. Um, and what? it was just a complete, you know, this, this open argument around scaling. And one of the original investors, like Roger Ver, um, that invested in a lot of the companies, we'd co-invested in many of them, like blockchain.com and Circle and Ripple Labs and various other ones we invested in. Um, and, uh, you know, they forked off and created... Bitcoin Cash. And at the time, the narrative was, actually, there's going to be 42,000 Bitcoin. And if you broke the 21,000 Bitcoin, and you could actually just fork off and create another coin, um, and uh, then, you know, the whole point of Bitcoin as hard money just disappears. Um, and then we had, you know, um, we invested, there was this, uh, this, this, this editor called Vitalik Buterin that was pitching the Bitcoin community and saying, we've got this new concept, we can't create colored coins. Um, what's now ordinals, they were trying to create these new protocols. You had uh, MasterCoin, you know, all these different things, creating ICOs on top of Bitcoin and OmniLayer and everything. 
but everyone wanted to create stock markets and so he said right i'm just going to create a new one and uh, i invested in the ethereum ico uh, still haven't touched those coins um and coins. uh the um you know and uh, this new blockchain came along and then we had 10,000 tokens or at the time it was probably a thousand tokens and um, it was really what I call the cycle of proving that we could survive money printing and Bitcoin stood out as unique. Um, and at the end of it, Bitcoin still stood out as unique, no matter what happened, and no one could replicate the properties of Bitcoin. Um, and it survived the third cycle, hit all, new all-time highs, had the ICO boom and bust, um, had that. We're, we're actually now in the fourth cycle. Um, the fourth cycle I call surviving the quantitative tightening cycle. Uh, the reason for that is because Bitcoin was created in 2008 from quantitative easing. Um, and we have never experienced quantitative tightening in Bitcoin's history. And so we had the, the rate hikes and we had the crypto companies that all leveraged up. Uh, they blew up. There was a bunch of frauds that happened. Um, we had, you know, the what I call the, 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 bank, the bank run crisis of 2023, the crypto deleveraging crisis of 2022. Um, we had the COVID um, rate hikes and, you know, uh, basically Bitcoin survived and it um, was a hedge against all of that. Now, um, we're still in that cycle because now we're reaching the stage where we hit the the institutional adoption. We had the sovereign adoption with El Salvador. I, tr I tried to make Bitcoin legal tender in the UK and Isle of Man, but then it happened in El Salvador after about seven years of effort. Um, I, that wasn't me that did it, but um, I got to meet the president and played a little role in that. Um, and uh, so, so now that's the quantitative tightening cycle. So if we reach all new all-time highs and we survive, uh, we get through Bitcoin halving as we have, and everything's lined up to me uh, looking like, right, we've got the institutional adoption, we get the Bitcoin ETF at this stage, um, we go through the next halving cycle, um, and Bitcoin still prevails and they haven't managed to shut it down. Everything else maybe becomes a security um, and then I started projecting a little bit further forward. This, this is actually from a, a book I'm writing at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I believe the next cycle and much of the content you cover, Guy, is um, surviving the central bank digital currency cycle. And so obviously CBDCs are going to be um, completely disruptive to the banking system. Um, but we need to prove that we can get through a whole cycle in wave of IMFs being aggressive against our, um all of the different various factors that come from CBDCs. Um, so I think that's the next cycle that needs to be survived, that we'll need to survive. After that, I think we hit a world of the unknown. And um, I think that's when we get mature enough where things like quantum computing, which can break Bitcoin's cryptography if we don't adjust at that stage. Um, you've got artificial intelligence, which will probably power central bank digital currencies. You've got regulators and central banks that will probably be disrupted by AI itself. Um, and Bitcoin's proof of work will probably be the only thing that we have to hold on to if it can survive that cycle. Um, once you survive these major, major cycles and major, major threats, you know, the whole 51% attack, quantum computing, all these different things, you end up where Bitcoin probably just is digital hard sound money. I call it a speculative store of value because you have to get through all those speculations. And the, the returns were like the first cycle was like, you know, a million and a half percent returns. Then it was 7,000% returns. Then it was 2,000% returns. And now it will probably be, you know, they're, they're decreasing slightly until you hit the point where it's much like gold. It is actually a store of value with a fixed supply. Um, and I think we've got several cycles to go through. And then you can start looking at unit of account and median of exchange uh, based upon surviving those cycles. Wow, there's 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 so much to unpack there, Simon. It's um, but it's fascinating because I remember one of the things you uh, one of the things you sort of said for, uh, in that um, presentation was, uh, eventually, Bitcoin is going to become a lot more boring in in terms of kind of price action. You know, in terms of these these incredible incredible gains that we've seen over the over the course of these cycles. Um, but uh, which is of course, as you say, sort of you know several years in the future um but it's still there are still these these enormous kind of challenges to face but it's it's brilliant to get that perspective of someone because you know okay yes there are lots of things current you know currently threatening bitcoin and in the case of things like quantum computing and possibly ai that are that are going to pose a threat to bitcoin in the future but it's it's heartening to know that kind of bitcoin has already survived i mean 
arguably perhaps way more serious threats to you know to it to its existence i think you um you talked about mount gox in particular and obviously that was you know mount gox was accounted for the vast majority of of bitcoin trading at the time and yet the fact that it's managed to survive things like that is is kind of proof if you like of of just how uh, robust the technology is yeah i completely agree and so that that is the opportunity the opportunity is that if we overcome every type of hurdle and reach the point where it's, you know, each cycle we get more and more obvious that Bitcoin's going to succeed. And the earlier you were in believing that Bitcoin would succeed, the higher the returns were. Uh, but still, what, when, I, when we cover the Bitcoin investing rules, I want people to understand that the returns in each cycle, even if it reaches that phase, are more than enough to achieve most people's financial goals. Obviously, not financial advice, but um, the the bringing back the concept of savings into the financial system, which is what Bitcoin does. You know, hard money where you can reliably see the supply and it won't change um, is stops people from having to speculate and invest all the time. And so, by having a product that can be used for savings. Um, that changes the dynamics of and reverses the dynamics of fiat currency for those that actually exit. Um, And I think Bitcoin gets closer and closer to just being a saving store of value, you know, with steady, not abnormal returns eventually. And that will happen as more and more institutional adoption and sovereign adoption happens and as it becomes more and more liquid, which clearly we're on that trajectory. Um, but there's still a lot of early adoption here. Um, you know, we still got all of those institutions and all of those countries to come in. Yeah, yeah. Let's. I think that's a good point um, to, uh, to to mention the institutional adoption because this is something that's been in the, in the news recently. Um, obviously, uh, uh, the idea of a of a spot Bitcoin ETF has been a bit of a meme in in crypto circles for the last few years because it's kind of seen as this not this promised land, but kind of this really important next step to take with, with especially with institutional adoption. Obviously, uh, BlackRock kind of surprised everyone uh, a couple of weeks ago by, by filing for an ETF. And the, the thought was that BlackRock, you know, these guys who, who account for a third of the ETF market in the United States have only ever had one ETF application rejected. Um, the, 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 a lot of people seem to seem to think that uh, this could be the moment for it. Do you do you think do you, do you feel with all your experience that this is the right moment for a spot Bitcoin ETF, or is this kind of is this a bit of a does this feel like a bit of a hail mary uh, to you from from BlackRock? Um, I've actually got a bet that it is. So um, Rob, Rob from Digital Asset News bet me on Twitter and said. Um, uh, for those that don't know, I'm actually the largest single creditor in the Celsius bankruptcy. Um, so I had a small percentage of my Bitcoin where I would borrow against it and I got scammed by Alex Majinski. Um, and uh, that's consumed about a year of my life, <laughs> um, trying right. to uh, help help all the, all the victims of the Celsius case. Um, and actually at your conference, there was so many of them there. It was really amazing really? to just meet so many people in face to face. Um, that have been victims of that scammer. Um, but uh, yeah, um, the oh, why, why did I go on to that? Yeah, ETF. Um, so yeah, we've been at the whole um, ETF phase for a, since 2013. Um, and I, yeah, that's why I said it. Um, I've got a bet. And um, if it's not approved by Q1 2024, which I bet that it would be, and Rob bet that it wouldn't, um, then we have to wear an I Love uh, Mashinsky t-shirt. Um, on that. So I've got a bet. So I'm putting my money where my mouth is. And if anyone knows my background, they'll know that's serious. I don't want to wear that t-shirt. Um, so I 100% yeah. believe that the BlackRock ETF will be approved. Now, um, when I say 100%, crazy things happen in crypto, as you will know, and anyone that's been involved in the industry. Um, but I think this one is pretty certain. Um, we've been at it since 2013, since the Winklevoss tried to get the ETF approved. Um, we got the custody side set up. Although... Um, You know, if you look at the Coinbase, and I was an early investor in Coinbase, um, what I, how I interpret the SEC is they're trying to say get back to your roots of being a Bitcoin business. Um, Do we might give you Ethereum staking if you behave well with Bitcoin? We've got all these institutions that will make you the custodian to their ETF, take away all the shitcoinery and make them securities. And just so you know, um, 
we actually sold our securities business to Coinbase. So they have the regulations oh, wow. and licenses to operate it. They bought it from us. So we spent years building a US broker dealer um, that they acquired and an ATS, which allows them to actually trade securities. So I think they want all of that to go over there. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so the, um, I, the way I interpret it is it's already been predetermined that they're approved, otherwise BlackRock wouldn't have applied. Um, the market manipulation is being dealt with in the surveillance um, agreements that have uh, recently been announced, surveillance sharing agreements. Um, Coinbase, although they're being sued, they're being sued to try and get all the shit coins over to securities, um, but the, they, want, they want them to be a custodian for Bitcoin. That's not any of their activities that they have issues with. Um, and all of the TradFi players need a, need a custodian. Um, and Coinbase has really built up that expertise. And that's where I think they'll, they'll shine and prosper. Um, I, I believe 100%. And if not, I'm wearing an I Love Mashinsky t-shirt um, that the Bitcoin ETF will be approved. And then it just comes to the question, is that good or bad for Bitcoin? Well, it's probably really good for price. Um, and I think you enter into a two-tiered market. Um, so right now you have a bunch of exchanges and people that don't understand hardware wallets and self-custody end up leaving their Bitcoin on those exchanges. Um, even a veteran, like someone that's been around, I still got burnt in quite a few of them. Um, we had to restructure Bitfinex. I was a creditor there. Uh, we did a, a whole security token structure to support um, Bitfinex when they got hacked. Um, and uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm a, the largest individual creditor in uh, yeah. in the Celsius case as well. So still happens um, to someone like me, but it goes into a two tiered market where most people will probably, you know, be investing through their traditional brokerage account. It will end up in an ETF with BlackRock or Fidelity, um, and then people, the everyone else will realize that the true power of Bitcoin is owning your own money, spending your own money. Um, and actually the speed of being able to get it out of that ETF uh, when you realize you've just got a layer on top of the fiat currency system that's exposed to everything in the traditional financial markets. Um, and eventually, hopefully, it's an onboarding exercise for people to realize the true power of Bitcoin and, and hold it themselves. Um, but I think it will bring in a lot of demand to um, getting exposure to Bitcoin and then educating people that this is a really bad way of owning Bitcoin, unless you're doing it for tax reasons in your retirement plan. Yeah, I guess I, I guess as a sort of as as a kind of gateway to the world of Bitcoin, you know, an ETF can can be can be a good thing in that respect. Obviously, it'll bring it'll bring investments, and you you can imagine sort of lots of more what you might call traditional investors who want to you know who like the idea of allocating a percentage of their portfolio to Bitcoin. Um, you, you would think that the, that ETF would, you know, it, well, and others like it would offer that sort of security for them. And of course, yeah, th there is there is this kind of problem in in crypto in general, isn't there? This I think a lot of people there is still the perception um, that you, that hardware wallets are tricky to use. And I mean, I've I, I've lost count of the number of people who've said to me, "I've got a hardware wallet. I just I, you know I just haven't set it up. It seems mm. really complicated." And I, you know, I've had to say it's 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 really not. You know, they've they've spent a lot of time and effort to make this really quite straight, really as straightforward as it can possibly be. But still, there there are people wary of that side of it, aren't there? And wary of the idea of of custodying your own money, sort of, you know, um, you know, being responsible for it. And I, I guess it as well who who don't quite appreciate the the nature of financial freedom. Is it because? And I think a lot of people tend to associate the idea of financial freedom with just having enough money to do whatever the heck you like. And I think as you as you and many others have, have, have kind of touched on, it's it's not so much about that. It's about it's about having the freedom to spend your money whenever and wherever you like um, without interference, without any other third party, you know, coming in, coming between you and and those 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 games and those um uh, outcomes and yeah, it's it's this idea that um, you know you are you are fully in control and of course this takes us to the idea of CBDCs, which as you say is the topic of your next book and and this is the this is this is going to be sort of the the next big cycle as it were the the um, central bank digital currencies sort of 
basically sort of taking the taking some of the ideas that Bitcoin has has developed and and using them for 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 the for the ends of central banks. Yeah. So um, in in my first book, I didn't call it CBDCs, but I talked about how um, banking in crisis will transition to a full digital currency issued by the central bank. Um, and I went through the exact set of events that would happen in the next financial crisis um, in order to actually roll that over. And I laid out the whole transition um, and the importance of Bitcoin. So it, it, I did. I have been at this subject for longer than I've been at Bitcoin um, on digital currency through fiat. Um, and so you know, tying the two topics together, you know, if you've got a retirement plan and you're looking in, you're logging into your Fidelity account. And I did this. Like when I left investment banking, I had a I was contributing and I had this retirement account left over um, and I was looking at it and it was never good. It was going up very, very slow, um, you know, just in line with inflation and stocks were beating slightly um, and bonds were, you know, giving negative yield in that. And uh, I put some of it into a, a, some crazy Bitcoin trust project. It wasn't GBTC. It was some really early one with like Swedish Krona or something. Um, but it would beat the shit out of everything in the portfolio. And suddenly the Bitcoin side would just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And every time I was like, well, I've got to rebalance now because the Bitcoin keeps dwarfing the stocks. Um, and I was like, but why am I doing that? And so, you know, I, I had that. And I think everyone will go through that. They'll see this Bitcoin starts dwarfing. They go to rebalancing of their stocks. And they'll, um, and they'll realize that actually I need to own some of my own Bitcoin. Why am I doing this? Why am I paying these fees? Why am I doing these things? Um, until you actually get that first bleep of everybody should do this. Try and own some Bitcoin. Everybody should learn how to. The reason you need to get a hardware wallet is not just because it's the future of your finances with Bitcoin. Uh, you're going to need to own your digital identity and every, everything is going to be in the future. is going to be your ability to protect yourself from a hacker. That's the world we live in today. If you don't learn this skill now of how to protect financial value, and protecting financial value on your own is the ultimate education. Um, it's it's everybody needs to do that in the future for everything anyway. So you might as well use crypto as a way to learn it um, and get that excuse. And then once you've done it, you realize that it, it is just a skill. You just have to learn something new. You didn't know how to log into online banking. You never knew how to use a credit card. You just said, I need to use it. And you used it and you did it. And it's the same with Bitcoin. Eventually, it's as easy as sending an email. Um, but protecting yourself from hackers, nobody in the world has any choice but to learn how to do that. And having value on the line is the best way to learn because people treat it very, very seriously. Um, yeah, so I would do that. Now, on the CBDC side, um, the biggest threat of CBDCs is actually, as we experienced in 2023, is banking. It's not Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is an exit from banking. CBDCs is a way of stabilizing the banking system by completely taking it over. If you think about the way fiat currency is created, it's created every time someone issues a loan. So we already have a CBDC, but it's created by the private bank. Let's call it a private bank digital currency. And it's backed by debt and it's the world's largest regulated Ponzi scheme in the world. Inevitable, predictable, guaranteed, it will fail. Every fiat currency does fail. And it always ends in a hyperinflationary cycle of the world reserve currency that then defaults back to, um, you know, uh, co uh, military conflict that then takes you back to an environment where no country trusts each other and they use hard money to clear with each other and settle the conflict. Then a new world order starts, a new world reserve currency comes along, and then you repeat the cycle and you destroy it. Because money being backed by debt is a Ponzi scheme, it's regulated to try and make it go longer. Um, but as we experienced in 2023, it's fragile. The only solution um, is to take the China model and implement it globally. That's the future of every fiat currency. Um, there is no doubt about it, and there's no way of holding on to it. The only way to change that is to, you know, uh, not back money by debt, do full reserve banking, um, and that can actually be done with a central bank digital currency without going through an inflationary and deflationary cycle. So CBDC is the tool. <laughs> you know, the, uh, the Fed always talks about we have tools. The final tool is a CBDC. And they need it to be sophisticated enough to save the banking system. And they will wipe out all the banks. Um, every bank that goes bust, 
all those deposits will be replaced with a new wallet. You sign up to the yeah. terms and conditions, opt out of all your freedoms, um, and you have your CBDC to save your deposit. Um, and that that is an inevitable consequence of rolling over the system continually. Um, so it's here. Just embrace it and make sure you learn how to exit from it. Um, and that's what Bitcoin does. And that's why proof of work is the most important concept that we can preserve in order to protect ourselves from these quantum AI CBDCs that I believe will eventually lead to the disruption of governments and the disruptions of regulators um, and the disruption of the banks. It's, just, it's a scary prospect, isn't it? That what lies ahead, you know, and, and what has been, you know, this situation that has been allowed to develop. And every every so often we get reminders of it, don't we? I mean, I, I, the debt ceiling uh, business in, in the United States recently where they raised it once, it, you know, they went through this whole um, show, didn't they, of uh, will they, won't they raise the debt ceiling? And then, of course, at the last minute, they put together a deal. The ceiling goes up and you just add another another however many trillion dollars to this already gigantic pile of debt. And I think that was a good I think that was a good example for, you know, for people who might not be all that all that familiar with the with the financial system. There there is a there is a glaring example of just how of just how how much of a Ponzi scheme this is. You know, it's just just spin up another mountain of debt, add it to the pile. And the logical question is, how much longer can this can this last for? It, it, it's inevitable, really, that at some point it's all going to it's all going to fall down. Yeah, it's inevitable. And the real question is, who are the victims in that system? The victims in that system are the people that did everything that they were meant to do. You know, they yeah. they, they they got a good job, they went to university, they got massive student debt. Um, they took that student debt and they rolled over their credit cards. They got and got a job um, and they just keep going. And if they, they, they would have made two decisions, one decision would have been they would have leveraged the debt system in order to invest in real estate. And if they played the real estate game right, um, they would have been investing in stocks and they'd have a pension and they'd have assets. The beneficiary of the system is those that have assets. Um, if you played the game wrong, you would have excess consumption. And if you're in excess consumption, you would have, instead of buying real estate, um, you would have ended up consuming goods. And if you consume those goods, you end up with a pile of debt, a student debt, credit card debt, roll over that debt, and the, then you buy a mortgage, and then you get your mortgage debt, um, and then you just keep going and keep going into debt. Or there's the people that never even had that privilege, and they, you know, they just literally never got in a position where they could afford to have spend less than they earn and invest the difference. And if you're living month to month, it's wealth inequality that's paying for that. So, you know, it's that Cantillion effect, I think they call it, where those that are closest to the 0% interest loan, which is the largest financial institutions and central banks in the world, the closer you are, the more likely oh. you leverage those to buy assets and you're benefiting from the Fiat Ponzi scheme. The further away you are, i.e. those that didn't buy anything, can't borrow anything, and they get the massive predatory interest rates through, you know, um, you know uh, crazy subprime loans or uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, payday loans. Um, yeah. They're the ones that are completely shafted by the system. So the wealthy are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and that doesn't stop until eventually you end up with massive disparity um, where, you know, you have extreme left and right popular, uh, you know, um, arguments, and then that tends to lead to internal conflicts. Um, and then you get some financial product that blows up, blows up the banking system. When it blows up the banking system, you get the CBDC bailout. And all of a sudden, those economies, you know, America is looking more and more like China every day. China's looking more and more like America every day. And they compromise and meet in the middle with the CBDC. And you better have your Bitcoin at that point. You better not be discovering Bitcoin. Yeah. And it's it's just just thinking about some of the things that have been happening you know, even just over the last couple of weeks and that have been happening, I guess, in the wake of COVID as well. You know, you talk about wealth inequality, you talk about people being, you know, getting kind of ever further away from from the honeypot, if you like. And, and we're seeing this, aren't we? I, I guess the UK is a good example. You know, um, young people now are leaving university with more debt than ever before. They can't They can't afford a home. They can't afford to buy a home. Um, they can't afford a mortgage because rates have now shot up from you know sort of near zero 
just a few years ago to now what they're around sort of 6%, um, which is unaffordable for most people. Um, and they're now talking about issuing, I think, lifetime mortgages, 50-year mortgages, uh, in order to try and you know get people get people on the property ladder, and it it's all and the, you hear more and more about how this this generation coming through now for the first time in in decades is going to have a worse quality of life than their parents. You know that the 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 growth that the growth is not ju- not just leveling off, but is now starting to tail off quite alarmingly. Sorry to interrupt you folks, but I have to let you know about the Coin Bureau deals page. My team and I have been able to pull together some of the best promos and discounts in the whole crypto space. We're talking trading fee discounts of over 50%, thousands of dollars in bonus airdrops, amazing deals at top exchanges, reduced prices on hardware wallets, and much, much more besides. So just go to coinbureau.com forward slash deals, also linked to below, and find the promo suited to you. Enjoy the rest of the video. So, Simon, it's a it's it's a pretty disturbing picture at the moment. There's obviously there's obviously lots of kind of storm clouds on the horizon, which kind of brings us nicely, I think, to uh, those five investing rules that um, that you uh, that you gave in that presentation. And I think that would be a lovely way to to, to round things off now. So, could you could you talk us through those those five rules? Yeah, let's do that. So at, at the presentation, I gave five rules. I always like to leave someone empowered. Um, you know, it was pretty depressing before. Um, and it is really based upon my belief that the demand for Bitcoin in every cycle increases as more and more people need to adopt Bitcoin as the world's first digital hard sound money. There's only 21 million Bitcoin, more and more of them get lost and more and more financial institutions, sovereign countries and individuals and businesses will want them. You know, that's my assumption. Um, And so in that assumption, I've learned over the last decade by uh, being at the first Bitcoin conference. And I know people that were at that conference and are in a worse financial position than when they started, despite being involved in the highest performing asset in history. Um, and so these are really my my what I did, and I've and by the way I give them because I made every single mistake, and now I'm just so disciplined to them. Um, it took me a few years to get disciplined to them, um, but now I'm completely disciplined. And the first rule is no matter what, um, every single month, one simple thing that everybody I believe can do is own more Bitcoin this month than you did the previous month, and that's that one simple rule. It takes you away from over-speculation where you convert your Bitcoin into too many altcoins. It puts you in the discipline of spending less than you earn and investing the difference. Whether it's $10, whether it's $100, whatever is the percentage that's right for you, every single month, I will look at my net worth in Bitcoin. um, And I must have more Bitcoin that month than the previous month. That one rule, if everybody did it and Bitcoin succeeds, not financial advice, Um, as Guy always likes to say. Um, But if Bitcoin succeeds, which is the assumption, that one thing would have protected absolutely everybody and they would be in, um, you know, for me, that one rule has put me in a financial position that I never imagined was possible, from deep in debt to a number that I just couldn't even ever imagine could be possible. Um, And that's the first rule. Um, I've got them here as well. So um, the second rule is how do you do that? Um, The way that you do that is you stop valuing your wealth in fiat currency and you value your wealth in Bitcoin. So when I'm asked what is my net worth, and I won't answer that question, um, even though people (laughs) ask, um, most most people will say a dollar amount. Um, In my mind, the dollar amount is irrelevant. It's the Bitcoin amount. How many Bitcoin do I own? And the reason that that's important is because the lower the price of Bitcoin, the more I get that month. My rule is I got to have more Bitcoin each month than the previous month. The price goes down, then I have more Bitcoin this month. And I value my wealth in Bitcoin. As the price goes up that month, I'm going to have less Bitcoin um, in terms of new Bitcoin relative. Um, Mm -hmm. I'll never have less Bitcoin unless I violated my rule. And I can only violate my rule by over speculating or getting it wrong. And so by valuing your wealth in Bitcoin rather than dollars, you're focused on st- stacking sats um, and figuring out an approach that gets you more Bitcoin. It can be as simple as earn in fiat, spend less than you earn, invest the rest of it, a fixed amount in Bitcoin, 
Um, and then a percentage of that, maybe you want to degen or whatever you want to do. But just always end up with more Bitcoin each month. That's the second rule, is value your wealth in Bitcoin. Uh, the third rule is about, um, I put up a diagram of compartmentalizing your, your money. Um, and when I think of money, um, you know, some people call it currency. I call it money if it's hard, currency if it's soft. I call fiat currency and hard money. And the difference is whether it's designed to go up in value because of your savings is money to me. A store of value is a property of money. Um, currency is not a store of value because it's worth less um, because of the fiat Ponzi scheme. But I separate it into four. My first is spending. The, um, I spend only in the same currency that mo the majority of my expense is in. So if I'm in, a, if I'm in a dollar country, then I spend in dollars. I don't spend in Bitcoin because I don't want to be at the mercy of the markets. Um, so I only spend where there's no currency risk. So the best technology for spending, I believe to be fiat currency, um, if and only if you're denominated in the same. So if your rent is in pounds, then spend pounds. Don't take currency risk on your expenses. Um, that's the first bucket. That's how you survive. The second bucket is savings. Now, savings was taken out of the equation by fiat currency because fiat currency does not make you more than the value of the fiat currency going down. So most people skip savings and go straight to what I call investment, the third bucket. Um, investment is where you invest in stocks, um, assets, you know, various other assets, um, your pension, real estate, property. Um, but most people skip savings. The reason they skip Whoa. savings is because it's hard to get hard money. There's only two forms of hard money that I know of today. A speculative one, which is Bitcoin, and real hard money, which is gold. Um, so yeah. the second bucket is savings. Your savings um, is where I take some of my fiat currency and I, and I invest in my savings. I buy Bitcoin and I buy gold. Then I put it in the third bucket, which is where I try and uh, outperform my savings. And by outperforming, I have to take additional risks. And by taking additional risks, I risk losing that because I'm trying to get a higher return. And that's the definition of an investment. Um, so this is why I ended up with a bunch of money in Celsius. I tried to borrow against it. It went wrong. I invest a bunch in equity, Kraken, companies, all these different things. But I never do more than my savings. You know, my savings has to stay that fixed amount. And then you have yeah. investment. If you follow that rule, I found that I ended up in a position where the fourth bucket is where I just use my money to do whatever the frick I want in the world. Um, and that's what I call contribution. And so for the last year, um, I've been supporting Celsius victims because it helped me. I had a bunch of money on the line. Um, but also, I had the ability to be able to do that because I followed the other rules. Um, I had my spending money covered. I had my savings increasing. I had my investment and the exact strategy of how I invest. And it puts you in a level of financial freedom when you do the numbers um, of being able to uh, contribute however you want. And most people never do that. And here's what I find. The majority of people underestimate what they can achieve in 10 years and overestimate what they can achieve in a year. And so they end up yeah. speculating, think that they need the next 10x coin, um, putting it, trying to find two, excess yield. You don't actually need any of that. If you just stuck to Bitcoin over the last 10 years and implemented these rules, and then you invested a percentage of it, um, th I've done the maths and I've done the graphs. No matter where you start, the people that did that are in a financial position that they never imagined because they had a longer term plan and they compartmentalize their money. Um, so that's the third, the third rule. Uh, the fourth rule is investing for different eventualities. Um, so I do actually invest for Bitcoin's failure, even though I 100 congruently believe that the cycle is going to prevail. Um, because I never want to be in the position that my father was where he lost all his money um, and we had to figure out how to rebuild at a time when he was too old to do it. Um, so my fourth rule is invest for what I call three empires. Invest, if, if you try to second guess the Federal Reserve, you would have gone broke. Um, because I believe that the real estate market was going to crash ages ago. I thought the Ponzi scheme was going to, you know, everything that makes sense turned out that they could roll over that Ponzi scheme for way longer, even maybe they can outstrip our lifetime. Um, because we don't know when the Ponzi scheme is going to end. So I do have a possession a percentage of my investments 
that just does the same old index funds, dollar portfolio, that believes that the central bank digital currency will prevail um, in the US to roll over the empire and the empire continues. But I then invest for a second. So that's my traditional portfolio. If Bitcoin fails, mm -hmm. if quantum computers takes it down, that one will still be okay. Um, it always gets, you know, it always gets rebalanced because the Bitcoin portfolio just completely outstrips it. Um, but then the second is a change of empire. So I believe in my lifetime, because how fiat currency cycles, um, that we will get a change in empire. Um, I don't really care who it is. I personally believe it will be China. Um, but in times of complete new world orders, um, changing of empires, fiat currencies are useless. Um, and people only trust gold. I believe the next cycle, they'll probably trust Bitcoin. Um, but if whatever happens, if Bitcoin fails, if the empire changes and the whole dollar system, which will change, it's just will it be in my lifetime, uh, then I invest in gold and have my change of empire portfolio. The final portfolio is what I call the no empire. You remember the six cycles? I believe that eventually you have quantum AI CBDCs that disrupt governments and borders and regulators. Yeah, yeah. Um, I believe that that's where Bitcoin prevails. And it's probably the thing, the proof of work behind Bitcoin is the one thing that will allow humans to have leverage in that type of environment. Um, and so that's really the no empire environment exit from the system. I don't really care what happens in geopolitics. I just know that whatever happens there, this one should be okay, as long as it survives. And the third one always outperforms the other two in the whole lifetime that I've been doing it over the last decade or so. Um, so that's the, right. the fourth rule is invest for three different outcomes. Um, I want everyone to be okay no matter whatever ha happens because most people are betting on one thing. You can do that when you're young, but from my experience, you know, when my father lost all his savings and I've seen all these pensioners and retirees in Celsius that can't go back to work, I don't want that for anyone and I want everyone to be protecting themselves. Um, and that really begins, gives me to the final rule um, which is everybody, um, you know, should have um, what I call a 10-year plan and rather than a one-year plan. And I talked about that. Um, at least have a 10-year plan. Um, and if you look at the market, when I was predicting in what the market would look like, I said there would be Bitcoin. Um, it appears that Ethereum will survive this regulatory crackdown. It appears that stable coins and CBDCs will be an important part of the future but it's likely that everything else is going to be some kind of security or a virtual assets that's regulated with a lot of the controls of the security. Um, yeah. And really, you can see that play out for the next 10 years. Um, and so get ready for your 10-year plan rather than your one-year plan. And that will stop you doing all the FUDs, the FOMOs, the DGENs. Um, you can still do that with a percentage if you follow these rules. I don't, I'm not saying don't do that because... I invested yeah. in Ethereum with a small percentage of my Bitcoin. It was great. Um, I also invested in Celsius. It was awful. Um, and so, you know, those are my five Bitcoin investing rules. And it would be a, a pleasure and an honor if somebody just, uh, you know, somebody adopted some of those. And those people that were at that first Bitcoin conference, the ones that are mega billionaires, approaching trillionaires, some of them, um, some of them, you know, or they they survived it while ever while others didn't survive. It's because those five Bitcoin are the best of what I got in terms of getting you through what I think the next ten years will survive. Well, well, folks, there you have it. Those those last few minutes, especially um, where Simon's talking about those five rules, those those could well turn out to be the best spent minutes of of your life. Um, Simon, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. I um I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, to to cover all that and yeah those five rules are it's just it's the most amazing stuff so um yeah everyone everyone listening I hope you were taking notes um Simon there's so much uh, so much more I'd like to talk about but we are running out of time of course but um I hope that uh, I hope that we can pick up this this conversation again in future because you know there, there I think there are very few people out there with with your experience who have been through so much and have who have been in Bitcoin since the beginning. So it's a real pleasure to get your uh, to get your take on everything. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for giving me so much of your time. And um, yeah, let's let's do this again sometime. Yeah, thanks a lot, Guy. I just want to say um, the education that you've been providing is probably you know education. I believe is one of the most important things out there that you could give anyone. It's a gift. 
Um, and so I think you've done an amazing job at that. Um, so, um, and uh, I want everyone to understand and appreciate and leave on a message that we are actually alive at one of the most interesting and exciting times in financial history. For some people, they're going to get absolutely wrecked. Others are going to do really well. And it really is the education and what you implement and put into action that's going to make the difference. And I hope that you're going to be one of those people because there's going to be a lot of other people that are going to need a, a lot of support. Um, and so I hope this is the first interview of many. I would love to talk to Guy about many other things. Um, and uh, yeah, this is just, uh, I just want to give an intro there. And uh, unfortunately, I got to jump off. But thank you very much, Guy. Thank you, Simon. It's been great. It's been great. Let's do this again. Thank you. Okay, so there you have it, guys. Simon Dixon, uh, one of the true Bitcoin OGs, uh, a man who really has seen and done it all uh, in the world of Bitcoin. It's such an honor to get his insights and his wisdom, and I really appreciate uh, him coming on the show. I'll leave some links below as to where you can follow Simon, where you can learn more about his work. Uh, I do uh, also highly recommend his book, uh, Bank to the Future. And of course, as he said in that uh, in that discussion, he's working on another one as well. And I, for one, cannot wait. So uh, I will make sure that um, that he lets us know uh, when we can expect that. And yeah, I will definitely try and get Simon back on again very soon. So thank you for watching. Please do let us know what you thought in the comments. And we will be back again very, very soon.